Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast. We have a special treat for you based on a podcast we recorded almost a year ago with Patty Callahan Henry about her new book, Becoming Mrs. Lewis. We were very excited about this because she is a New York Times bestselling author, and she wrote an historical romance from the perspective of Joy Davidman, whom C.S. Lewis married, trying to get in the mind of Davidman, and it gives a whole new perspective on this relationship that people have been trying to figure out for years. That episode, when we interviewed Patty, remains our most popular to date. So back in February, Patty reached out to us to be part of her new podcast, and she has launched an entire seven-part series that explores behind the scenes of Becoming Mrs. Lewis. We wanted to share with you, our listeners, our interviews with Patty for her podcast as bonus episodes. Go check out Patty's new podcast, Behind the Scenes of Becoming Mrs. Lewis. That's the title of her novel. You can search for it on almost any major platform. Patty has interviews with scholars and figures that our regular listeners will be familiar with, some of whom we have interviewed on the Wade Center podcast, Doug Gresham, uh, Joy Davidman's son, and Jack Lewis's stepson, as well as Don King, a noted authority on both Lewis and Joy as poets. We hope you enjoy these bonus episodes. If you haven't already, don't forget to listen to our interview with Patty, episode four back in December of 2018. As always, thank you for listening and supporting the Wade Center podcast. We'll return to our regular schedule on November 1st with a lively discussion and exploration of C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce featuring Dr. Jerry Root. We went down a street and turned a corner. We went down the street and turned the corner, and there, it seemed, there was the castle. Always, if you knew, if you knew how to go, you could walk down a street, the daylight street, that twisted about and ended in grass. There it was, always, the castle, remote, unshadowed, childish immortal, with two calm giants guarding the portal, stiff in the sunset, Strong to defend, stood Castle Safety at the world's end. O oh, Castle Safety, love without crying, honey without cloying, death without dying, hate and heartbreak, all were forgot there. We always woke, we never got there. Fairy Tale by Joy Davidman Patty Callahan, and this is Behind the Scenes of Becoming Mrs. Lewis, an in-depth exploration into the improbable love story of Joy Davidman and C.S. Lewis. You'll hear the stories behind the stories of the best-selling novel Becoming Mrs. Lewis, along with interviews from some of the foremost experts on their lives and love. These women just knew that they had to exercise almost dramatic, excessive pronunciations of their will in order to get any attention at all. It makes her so much like Dorothy Sayers. Sayers wanted to be known for the quality of her work, the integrity of her work. And in fact, when people would interview her and ask information about her personal life, she says, it's not about me, it is about the integrity of the work. That imperiousness, which you see in both Dorothy and Joy, had to do with the recognition that they'll only get heard if they're imperious. One of my favorite stories about Dorothy Sayers is when they wanted to change her radio plays to make them softer and more childlike. She was incensed that this was about the quality of her work, and she just took her contract, and rather than saying, well, I'm not going to honor it. She tore it up in little tiny bits, 
put it in an envelope and mailed it back to BBC Radio. Episode four, why joy? Why did C.S. Lewis choose Joy Davidman? With Dr. Crystal Hurd and Dr. Crystal Downing. So often we wonder, why did C.S. Lewis marry so late in life? Why joy? Today, we will talk about the powerful women who came before joy in C.S. Lewis's life. First, we'll talk with Dr. Crystal Downing, along with her husband. She is the co-director of the Marion E. Wade Center in Wheaton, Illinois. She was the Distinguished Professor of English and Film Studies at Messiah College. Crystal has published nearly 80 essays on topics ranging from the Amish to Jane Austen. And her literary criticism appears in eight critical editions of canonical texts. She is widely published, and her first book is about Dorothy Sayers, a fascinating woman that we believe prepared C.S. Lewis for Joy Davidman. Hello, Crystal. So lovely, as always, to talk to you from the Wade Center. How did you first hear about Joy Davidman? As you're the co-director of the Wade Center with your husband, Dr. David Downing, I'm assuming it's connected to that research and writing. And since David is a C.S. Lewis scholar, I learned about Joy through him. But I first got more intensely interested in her when we watched productions of Shadowlands. There was a Josh Ackland production of Shadowlands. And then, of course, then there was the Anthony Hopkins production. And then we talked about the problematic interpretation of their relationship that is displayed in Shadowlands. Your work on Dorothy Sayers has opened my heart to another brilliant and fiery woman from this same time. When I read about Dorothy through your eyes, I often compare her to Joy. They seem to have some really similar personality traits, and Lewis is quoted as saying he liked Dorothy for her zest and her edge in conversation. Dorothy exposed Lewis to a woman's mind and personality. I would love to talk to you a little bit about how you see Dorothy and Joy's similarities and how you think Dorothy prepared Lewis to meet Joy. Well, both were extraordinarily brilliant women who were born at a time where opportunities for women were almost nil. Here, Dorothy Sayers went through Oxford University, did all the exact same work that males did. In fact, did superior work than her male peers, but she didn't get a degree from Oxford because they didn't think women should have college degrees. And after the fact, in fact, after the Great War, they started giving degrees, but I think even that was cynical because the Great War devastated Oxford University, so they thought, well, if we got more women here, that would bring in income. I'm being a little cynical. (laughs) Well, sometimes we have to be a little cynical. In your essay, The Divine Comedy of C.S. Lewis and Dorothy Sayers, You say that Sayers exposes Lewis to the power of a woman's mind and personality. So when joy comes along, there is almost this recognition of a woman like that. Yeah. Both of them prickled against cultural constructions of gender, and joy assumed that, well, what every woman needs to do and wants to do is become a a wife and mother. And then for any woman who is a writer, they inevitably understand what Virginia Woolf was saying in A Room of One's Own. To be a writer, you need a room of one's own. But especially as a mother, how you have all these responsibilities. And so I I even think this is behind Joy leaving her sons behind for three months just to escape. And she kind of used the excuse of her health, but just feeling imprisoned and by the constructions of gender. And I think for both of them, this explains why other people who just look at them from the outside to go back to tools Thoughts in a woodshed? Meditations. Meditations in a woodshed, in a tool shed. shed. Those who look at them versus with them. These women just knew that they had to 
exercise almost dramatic, excessive pronunciations of their will in order to get any attention at all. So one of the stories I love about Joy, I just finished reading Abby Santa Maria's biography, Joy, which is fascinating. Joy was sitting in a restaurant with 14 other people in New York City, and some African-Americans come in, and the restaurant won't seat them. And so Joy said to all the 14 people, we are not staying in this restaurant. And she just made them all get up and leave because of the racism in this restaurant. So that imperiousness, which you see in both Dorothy and Joy, had to do with the recognition that they'll only get heard if they're imperious. One of my favorite stories about Dorothy Sayers is when they wanted to change her radio plays to make them softer and more childlike. She was incensed that this was about the quality of her work, and she just took her contract, and rather than saying, well, I'm not going to honor it, she tore it up in little tiny bits put it in an envelope and mailed it back to BBC Radio. And it's almost as though they both recognized, unless they're almost histrionic about what they do, they're not going to get attention. But then other people who are used to cultural constructions of gender just say, oh my goodness, they're so off-putting, they're just so obnoxious. But they had these, both of them had these incredible intellects. And that is what attracted C.S. Lewis to both of them, is that they could hold their own with Lewis and didn't need to use feminine wiles. And neither of them did. So Sayers also what I appreciate, and of course we don't have Joy's letters to Lewis, so we don't know exactly what she challenged him about. We know that there was give and take in their conversation. But Sayers actually challenged Lewis about his sexism, and she actually wrote this one letter to another woman writer. She said, do you like C.S. Lewis's work, or are you one of the people who foam at the mouth when they hear his name? I find most of his books very illuminating and stimulating, but I do admit that he is apt to write shocking nonsense about women and marriage. That, however, is not because he's a bad theologian, but because he's a rather frightened bachelor. So she was responding to his insight before he fell in love and married Joy Davidman. And, you know, he was no longer a frightened bachelor. Yeah, I I love how Dorothy says that Jesus would have treated women as if they had minds and souls of their own. Isn't that awesome? It just sounds like something Joy would say. There's almost this sense of rather than the shrinking violet woman that most of Lewis's peers wanted and expected in a woman and hence why they didn't like Joy, both Dorothy Sayers and Joy were willing to talk back to Lewis the way a mother would if they felt their son was saying something that was inappropriate or ill-informed. Can I add something to what she was saying about mother loss again? There's a strange incident in his 30s where Lewis and one of his friends were on a walking tour and they'd gotten all muddy. So they showed up at a pub that had rooms and the woman thought they were tramps. She said, if you go around to the back door, I'll give you some uh, leavings from the kitchen. And so rather than saying that they were two famous professors, they went around to the back door and waited for her to bring them a meal. And Lewis confided to his friend, there's some part of me that likes being ordered around by a woman. And once again, I think losing his mother, Mrs. Moore, who became his adoptive mother in his 20s and 30s and into his 40s, was a very take charge personality. And she often asked him to do domestic chores. And after she passed away and he met Joy, I think it's interesting that they got to know each other's minds first. There was a lot of correspondence. Mm -hmm. Lewis once said in his younger days that love was friendship plus physical attraction. And in some ways, that's the order in which he met Joy. They were intellectual friends before they met physically. But she was also very take charge. And here's these two bachelors who are very much living in this dilapidated house. And she immediately started making changes and carpeting and plastering and basically making it more habitable. 
And both brothers really loved her and responded to that. So there's always that element of intellectual companionship plus uh, love plus a kind of uh, alternative maternal presence in their lives. It's a very complicated well, relationship. Plus, C.S. Lewis's mother was brilliant. She had a degree in mathematics at a time when women not only didn't have degrees, but mathematics was not considered appropriate for women. I had a friend who was a mathematician at UCLA who was telling me about a new Barbie doll. And this was in the 1990s. It was a Barbie doll that you pulled the string and she spoke. And one of the things the Barbie doll said was, I hate mathematics. So (laughs) as late as the 1990s, that construction of gender was being perpetuated. So Lewis's mother, I bet, was an unusually brilliant woman. And that, that probably informs the way he responded to both Dorothy Sayers and Joy Davidman. Mm -hmm. There are more and more intellectual women out there, but what stands out about Joy is how young she was when she started distinguishing herself, and she got her degree. I mean, this was an incredibly brilliant woman, and she was hanging out and having conversations with Bertolt Brecht and Langston Hughes, Richard Wright. I mean, all these famous authors. What I like about her is I don't sense any name dropping on her part. She just allowed her own. Her own name, exactly. Joy didn't name drop about places like McDowell Artist Colony or how she won the Yale Younger Poets Award. She didn't walk around bragging. She wanted her work and her life to stand for itself. I feel like if she were alive today, one of the main things she would be known for is her actual work, not just being C.S. Lewis's wife. I think of what you said about her being so successful so young. Her first novel was critically acclaimed in her early 20s. She graduated with a graduate degree in a year and a half from Columbia. I have read parts of her thesis that she wrote when she was 19 years old. Yes. I think what she would have to say to us about breaking free of roles and of expected roles, and she would care more about the actual integrity of her work. Yeah, Mm -hmm. her own intellect to speak for itself rather than, well, you know, I once had a conversation with Bertolt Brecht, you know. It makes her so much like Dorothy Sayers. Sayers wanted to be known for the quality of her work, the integrity of her work. And in fact, when people would interview her and ask information about her personal life. She says, it's not about me. It is about the integrity of the work. And Sayers has a famous line that's the only Christian work is good work well done. And I think that's the frustration that Joy had and just why she just had to leave her sons behind, get out of America, is that she was no longer able to do good work well done because of all these other responsibilities Mm. in her life. And I would add initiative um, going after what she wanted. I have a lot of students right now who are, especially female students, they're very conscientious and dutiful, but they seem to be waiting for something to fall into their laps. And they're content to get good grades and hoping that that will lead to something wonderful. And I really like how Joy didn't wait for fortune to fall into her lap both in her writing projects, even in traveling to England, uh, corresponding with Lewis. She had a kind of initiative and a drive that I think was an important part of her success. And I think that could be a good lesson for contemporary uh, young people, especially young women. Yes and yes. Joy as an example for young women today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Drs. David and Crystal Downing. It has been an absolute honor getting to know Dorothy this way, and it makes me want to dig into her life even more so. You're right. I believe she totally paved the way for our beloved Joy. We hope you enjoy these bonus episodes. If you haven't already, don't forget to listen to our interview with Patty, Episode 4, back in December of 2018. As always, thank you for listening and supporting the Wade Center podcast. We'll return to our regular schedule on November 1st with a lively discussion and exploration of C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce featuring Dr. Jerry Root. Copyright 2019 by Thomas Nelson. Based on the book Becoming Mrs. Lewis 
The Improbable Love Story of Joy Davidman and C.S. Lewis. Copyright 2018 by Thomas Nelson. Poetry selections by Joy Davidman and C.S. Lewis. Read by Liz Hill and Simon Bubb. No portion of this recording may be used without the express written consent of the publisher. For more information on the people and stories featured in this episode, please visit becomingmrslewispodcast.com. This program was engineered by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at Kingswood Studios in Nashville, Tennessee, and produced by Jolene Bartow and Gabe Wicks. <laughs>